Hegel could, more or less, assimilate the sciences of his day, natural and social, and accommodate them in a system. But soon after, the expansion of the sciences and their growing prestige made such a system impossible. What were philosophers to do? One alternative was to become the handmaiden of the sciences and to adopt the mechanistic materialism that science seemed to recommend. But some philosophers declined this humble role and with the cry, back to Kant, a slogan coined in 1865, so it said. Philosophers were to continue Kant's project of transcendental idealism, resisting both materialism and Hegelian metaphysics. Like Kant, they pursued epistemology, not ontology, our knowledge of things, not the things of which we have knowledge. Like Kant, too, they equated knowledge with the mathematical and natural sciences. They explored the foundations, presuppositions of the sciences. But they had some differences with Kant. Kant seemed to believe that behind things as we know them, there are things in themselves that we can't know. On the one side there's us, with our inbuilt presuppositions, space, time, categories such as substance and causality. On the other side are things in themselves. These things in themselves are not in space and time, nor subject to causality, or at least we can't know that they are. But things in themselves transmit to us sensory material, and on this we impose forms of spatiality and temporality and categories. In this way we produce the phenomena we do know, in contrast to the noumena, the things in themselves, that we don't know. Kant erects a keep out notice before things in themselves, saying, as it were, don't ask questions beyond this point. But Kant retained unknowable things in themselves, for he clung to certain ethical and religious beliefs. Men are free and immortal, and there's a God who underwrites these gifts. The deterministic world of phenomena leaves no room for God, freedom and immortality. And immortality but Kant locates them in the realm of things in themselves. This is faith, not knowledge. I had to deny knowledge, Kant said, in order to make room for faith. Now, most of the Neo-Kantians saw no need for faith. They happily dispense with things in themselves for this and for other reasons. It is, for example, hard to see how things in themselves can provide sensations if categories like causality don't apply to them. Neo-Kantians also rejected Kant's view that concepts and intuitions, thoughts and sensations, are coordinate and independent of each other. Any sensations of which we are aware already involve thought and interpretation. So Neo-Kantians tend to downgrade sensations and stress the role of concepts in our experience. We produce science with little, if any, external input. If science is true, this is not because it reflects or corresponds to a realm outside science, but because of its internal coherence and orderliness. We produce science, but who are we? It's not we as concrete empirical individuals who produce it and produce the world science describes. If that were so, Neo-Kantian idealism would be subjective idealism, empirical idealism, according to which objects are products of our own minds. But that's not so. The objects encountered by an individual are real, empirically real, for the individual. Science is produced not by empirical subjects, but by the subject in general, or consciousness in general, the reason that all humans share. For this subject, the objects of science are ideal, while for the empirical subject they are real. Neo-Kantian idealism is transcendental idealism, but it accommodates empirical realism. Ernst Cassirer <coughs> was a pupil of Hermann Cohen, who established the conception of Kant dominant among Neo-Kantians. Cassirer began as a member of the Marburg School of Neo-Kantianism, <coughs> whose most important figures were Cohen himself and Paul Natorp though Cassira is better known in the English-speaking world. In his early works, Cassira too focused on the sciences, especially physics. In a 1910 book, Substance and Function, he argued that physics has progressed from a naive realism which pictures the world 
to an abstract symbolic system which orders the world but doesn't picture it. Science no longer presents a world of picturable substances. It applies functions that symbolise the world. And of course this view fits well with the transformation of atoms from solid little lumps into things that can hardly be described in literal language. So far, Cassira is a loyal Neo-Kantian, but later he realised that science isn't the only way of making sense of things. We symbolise in other ways too, language, mythology, religion and art. So, in the 1920s he wrote The Philosophy of Symbolic Forms in three volumes, Language, Mythical Thinking and the Phenomenology of Knowledge. Um, Kant had neglected language and was criticised for this by some of his contemporaries, especially Herder and Hamann. It may be surprising that Cassirer treats language as one symbolic form among others. Myth makers use language and so do scientists. But Cassirer regards language as rather a primitive thing with roots in mythology and it's gradually discarded as knowledge advances. Physicists use strange metaphors to convey in language what an electron is. The main point is that the mathematics works. Mythology and religion differ from science. They give mythical accounts of space, time and number that physics ignores. But myth is essential for the development of language. Coming to the third volume, knowledge in the title represents science, mainly mathematics and natural science, though Gossera considered also the social and cultural sciences later on. The word phenomenology, he explains, is meant in Hegel's sense, not Husserl's. His enterprise is Hegelian. Long quote from him. Philosophical knowledge must encompass the totality of cultural forms, and this totality can be made visible only in the transition from one form to another. The truth is the whole, yet this whole cannot be presented all at once, but must be unfolded progressively by thought in its own autonomous movement and rhythm. The end, the telos of the human spirit, cannot be apprehended and expressed if it is taken as something existing in, existing in itself, as something detached and separate from its beginning and its middle. Philosophical reflection does not set the end against the middle and the beginning, but takes all three as integral factors in a unitary total movement. In this fundamental principle, philosophy of symbolic forms, this is still, this is still Cassira speaking, philosophy of symbolic forms agrees with Hegel's formulation, however much it must differ in both its foundation and development. It too aspires to provide the individual with a ladder which will convey him from the primary configurations found in the world of immediate consciousness to the world of pure knowledge. From the standpoint of philosophical inquiry, every single rung of the ladder is indispensable. Every single one must be considered, appreciated, in short, known, if we wish to understand knowledge, not so much in its result, in its mere product, as in its character of a process, in the mode and form of its procedure itself. So that's the end of the Cassira quotation. So he's, he's Hegelian. Uh, there are differences, but similarities are quite striking. Hegel introduces his phenomenology of spirit by asking what is the absolute? That is, roughly, what are things in themselves? Hegel doesn't answer this question directly. He approaches it by considering our different ways of viewing the world, different forms or shapes of consciousness. He begins with the simplest form of consciousness, finds it internally incoherent, unstable, and moves on to another form of consciousness that repairs the inadequacies of the first. But that form in turn proves unstable and is followed by another form. And so it goes on until finally we reach absolute knowledge. Absolute knowledge, we might expect, will be knowledge of the absolute and will answer our original question, but it doesn't. What we get under the heading of absolute knowledge is an overall account of the forms of consciousness we pass through and the logical relations between them. Phenomenology of spirit is an introduction to Hegel's logic. 
And if he gives any answer to the question, what is the absolute, it's that the absolute is the logical structure of the world. Now, Kassira's approach is similar. Each symbolic form passes into the next, and each stage in a symbolic form passes into the next by what Kassira calls dialectic. Science is more adequate than mythology, but it's not that science is true and mythology false. Science doesn't represent or correspond to the way the world really is, and not because science is still incomplete, but because there is no world access accessible to us apart from symbolic forms, and no world at all apart from the world or worlds we create with symbolic forms. Science is superior to mythology because it gives a more coherent and orderly picture. But the picture isn't a picture of anything outside the picture. Nor are we urged to abandon mythology altogether, and still less language. Every symbolic form presents an essential aspect of the world. Kant believed that concepts and intuitions or sensations are coordinate and distinct. Concepts and the forms of space and time come from us. Intuitions are the given, and to them we apply concepts. Now Hegel questions this dualism. The nearest approach to given intuitions in the phenomenology of spirit occurs in the first form of consciousness, sensory certainty. But consciousness's attempt to pick them out, to pick out these intuitions without conceptualising them, fails. And it fails in Kassira too. We have no access to intuitions or sensations except through symbolic forms. We interpret things all the way down and never reach a raw, unconceptualised substratum. Even the conceptualised sense experience that we do have is discarded as we move from lower symbolic forms to higher ones. Kassira provides a ladder leaving from, leading from the primary configurations found in the world of the immediate consciousness to the world of pure knowledge. But it's not clear what these primary configurations are or whether there is any immediate consciousness. Kassira gives no clear answer to the question, what do we apply the symbolic forms to? What are we trying to order, to make sense of? Sometimes he draws a contrast between life and spirit, Laban and Geist, but usually to criticise philosophers such as Bergson, Zimmel, Scheler and perhaps Heidegger, who championed life against spirit. No clear view emerges of what life is, only the views of other philosophers about it. Sometimes he discusses animal life. An animal lives in a closed environment or umwelt, to which it is perfectly adapted. It has no stable entities, only inarticulated complex qualities. It perceives only things that serve its needs. A lizard hears a rustle in the grass, but not a nearby gunshot. A kingfisher sees insects only when they're moving. A spider detects a fly in its web only if it wriggles. Animals are aware only of what is actual, not of what is possible. We're not like that. We are aware of possibilities. We notice things that don't serve our needs and purposes. We form a conception of the whole world, not just our immediate surroundings. But that, for that we need language, symbolic forms, and how we get them is a mystery. In his Phenomenology of Spirit, Hegel gives an introduction to science, to the systematic philosophical consideration of the world. Science also considers things that aren't science, such as art, religion and history. But what interests Hegel are human cultural products, the world of spirit, not the world of life. Rational adults have an objective, rational view of the world, and they aren't just absorbed in their immediate surroundings and concerns. Hegel does mention one's individual world, the world seen from one's own viewpoint and centred on, one, centered on one's immediate surroundings. But attachment to this world, he says, is pathological and should be replaced by an objective scientific conception of the world. In this vein, Hegel says that proper knowledge is always expressed in language. How, we wonder, did Hegel find his way home or recognise his wife when he met her in the street? But Kassira sides with Hegel. 
He too is interested in large impersonal systems, not with what Heidegger called average everydayness, the births, lives and deaths of the individuals who ultimately form these large impersonal systems. Hegel and Kassira focus on spirit, Geist rather than Dasein. Another point, in Phenomenology of Spirit, Hegel distinguishes between, on the one hand, we, or us, that is Hegel and his audience, readers, and on the other hand, the form of consciousness we are considering. Hegel and his readers know things about a form of consciousness that this form of consciousness can't know, rather as we know things about dogs that dogs can't know, for example, that they're vertebrates. Each form of consciousness involves a particular type of self, and each form of consciousness has a particular conception of itself. An earlier and more limited form of consciousness cannot survey the whole range of forms of consciousness. It couldn't write the phenomenology of spirit. And Kassira's symbolic forms are similar. The answer to the question, what is a human being, varies with the symbolic form. It also varies according to whether the question is answered by an adherent to the symbolic form itself or by Kassira. A myth mythologizer gives a different answer than a scientist, presenting a mythological conception of a human being. And Kassira gives a different account of the mythologizing self than a mythologizer does, since he knows things about the mythologizer that the mythologizer doesn't know. But Kassira's answer reflects and respects the answer given by the mythologizer. He won't say that the mythologizer is just the same sort of human being as a scientist is, except that he's ignorant. For Kassira has no view about what a human being is, independently of the symbolic form under consideration. He cannot insist that humans are all as science views them, any more than he can say that science is true and mythology is false. Could a, a mythologizer produce or even understand Kassira's theory of symbolic forms? I suppose he might have a hazy conception of alternatives to his own symbolic forms. The Azandi no doubt gave some account of Evans Pritchard, just as he gave an account of them. But mythologizers who've met Evans Pritchard are not pure mythologizers. A pure mythologizer could hardly have any conception of science nor of any alternative to mythology. So Kassira, like Hegel, needs to have reached the end of the series of forms he surveys before he can survey them. Kassira has to be a scientific human being, though with a sympathetic insight into non-scientific humans. Kassira is, however, a philosopher and philosophy is not a symbolic form, it's just a way of describing symbolic forms. Hegel's phenomenology of spirit was intended as a ladder leading to absolute knowledge. And absolute knowledge is Hegel himself, Hegel's own philosophy. Kassira too says that he will provide a ladder leading to pure knowledge. But pure knowledge isn't Kassira himself. It's not philosophy, but science. Kassira draws a sharper distinction between science and philosophy than Hegel does. And Kassira's philosophical enterprise is therefore not motivated within the symbolic forms he described. His system is not self-enclosed, or as Hegel might say, infinite, in the way that Hegel's is meant to be. Moreover, Kassira disapproves of Hegel's logic. He cannot say, like Hegel, that the absolute is the logical structure of the world. Kassira reserves judgment on the absolute. Uh, those were some of Kassira's affinities with Hegel and some of his differences. Kassira's had little impact on Anglo Anglophone philosophy, but three or four books have appeared recently on him. Two of them deal with a marginal episode in Kassira's life, but an episode that probably accounts for the revival of interest in him, his debate with Heidegger at Davos in 1929. The debate turns on the interpretation of Kant, but there were deeper disagreements. The debate survives in only notes taken by the audience. In their published works, Kassira and Heidegger hardly mention each other. Heidegger reviewed Kant Kassira's book on mythical thinking and says roughly that it's fine, except that Kassira doesn't deal with Dasein the everyday life of birth, death, and death. He doesn't do what Heidegger did. Uh, and Kassira reviewed Kant, uh, 
Heidegger's book on Kant, and uh, it's quite a long, complicated review. In his third volume of Philosophy of Symbolic Forms, The Phenomenology of Knowledge, Cassirer says that what Heidegger says about space and time is fine, as far as it goes, but it deals with a more primitive level than Cassirer is concerned with. He adds that Heidegger's focus on the future and on death is what distinguishes his view of time from Bergson's. But Cassirer did leave some more extensive comments on Heidegger, and they're published posthumously in a fourth volume about symbolic forms called The Metaphysics of Symbolic Forms, and I'll uh, <coughs> deal with some of these. In 1940, Cassirer devised a typology of philosophy. He derives this from three aspects of the self. First, there is the I, or ego, itself. He calls this the I phenomenon, or sometimes life. Secondly, there's the phenomenon of action and the will. And thirdly, there's the phenomenon of the work, the products that the I, or we, create. Now, each of these basic phenomena is linked with a particular conception of knowledge and with a particular type of philosophy. The first, the phenomenon of the I, gives rise to Descartes, Bergson and Husserl. Husserl, Cassirer says, gives the most consistent statement of the pure I aspect of transcendental idealism in modern philosophy. And it's a brief summary, quote, the entire reality of things is swept aside, put in brackets. All that remains is the reality of the stream of consciousness, of the pure I, to which all so-called being, all truth, is related and in which it's founded. The second phenomenon, action and the will, gives rise to Fichte, Nietzsche, Marx, William James and Heidegger. And so Cassirer writes, as soon as we enter this second type, every claim made in the name of the theory of knowledge takes on a completely different meaning and another colour. A marked example of this is the turn that phenomenology has taken from Husserl to Heidegger. Here, the step is made from the first type, the monadic theory of knowledge, that's the first person, the I or ego view, to the second type, theory of will and action. Immediately, all the basic categories are changed. The pure I, being it for itself, now becomes being in the world. Intuition, the seeing of essences, disappears. Persistence in the self um, becomes, or I suppose that's resoluteness, becomes being driven to the outside, being driven forward. Dasein falls into care, and so on. Finally, the phenomenon of the work, the product, gives rise to Plato and Kant. Kant does not start from the I, as Descartes does, he starts with the work, especially natural science, and he tries to find its systematic form and the conditions of its possibility. Cassirer even squeezes Kant's ethics into this framework, saying, Kant is seeking the conditions of the possibility of morality. The morality he presupposes is purely formal, liberated from the despotism of merely material aims, that is, from the despotism of mere action, and purified into the simple contemplation, knowledge of the ought, knowledge of what duty is. Cassirer's own philosophy of symbolic forms continues Kant's project, he says. It is pure contemplation, not of a single form, but of all, the cosmos of pure forms, and it seeks to trace this cosmos back to the conditions of its possibility. End of quote. Earlier, in 1928, just before the Davos episode, Cassirer considers Heidegger in terms of the schema of life and spirit. At Davos, Heidegger claimed to have a clearer idea of his own starting point than Cassirer has of his. And Cassirer is indeed hazy about his starting point, about what underlies and generates the symbolic forms. Cassirer says that Heidegger starts from life, a special conception of life. Unlike Bergson, Heidegger was not interested in biology. This is all Cassirer. His background was in religion, so he interprets life in a religious sense. 
Life is temporal, in time, but time for Heidegger is not long stretches of historical and prehistorical time. Time is rooted in the present. It is constituted by care, an idea that Heidegger owes to St. Augustine, and by angst, anxiety, an idea he got from Kierkegaard, an anxiety arising from the prospect of one's own death. Though he was brought up as Catholic, nurtured on Thomas Aquinas, Heidegger fell under the spell of Martin Luther and the philosophers congenial to Lutherism, such as Kierkegaard and Augustine. Cassira quotes a passage about death. The challenge of death comes to us all, and no one can die for another. Everyone must fight his own battle with death by himself alone. We can shout into one another's ears, but everyone must be prepared finally to meet death alone. I will not be with you then, nor you with me." Unquote. This sounds like Heidegger, but in fact it's Martin Luther. <laughs> Heidegger's religion, <laughs> Heidegger's religion, Sierra says, draws its power from the individualistic tendency it takes from Luther and Kierkegaard. Cassira connects this individualism with Heidegger's aversion to inauthenticity, not doing one's own thing, but doing and thinking what they or one does. Everything general, Cassira says, all giving in to the general, or the universal, all giving in to the general, is for Heidegger a fall, a disregarding of authentic design, a giving in to the inauthenticity of the they. For example, language is a general or universal thing, not the product or possession of any one person. So, for Heidegger, language is a merely social phenomenon. It does not embody reason. It hardens into a mere talk about, into superficial idle talk. Here, giving in to the world of the general is again considered to be a mere looking away from oneself, a kind of fall from grace. Heidegger treats in history this is again it's all Cassira. Heidegger treats history individualistically. For him, all historical understanding is mere repetition, the bringing up again of personal design, personal destinies, personal fate. The resolute individual scours the historic past to find a possibility for his own existence. For Heidegger, the only meaningful thing is individual design. History as the history of culture, the history of meaning, as the life of the objective spirit is not disclosed. Something else that's inauthentic in Heidegger's view is the idea of infinite time. Authentic time, time as we primarily conceive it, ends with one's own death. This is what, in Cassirer's view, distinguishes Heidegger's account of time from Bergson's, that Heidegger stresses the future, anticipation of one's own death. Cassirer connects this with Heidegger's denial of eternal truths. For an entity that is in time and which passes away in time, there can be no eternal truths. The stigma of death is impressed upon everything human. The thought of in eternal truths seems therefore to Heidegger almost as a kind of hubris, a reaching beyond human limits, ignoring the primary phenomenon from de of death. Uh, that's how Cassira sees Heidegger and now he gives his own views, which are the objective spirit and culture, the general, the impersonal, does not consist merely in the pale, diluted social form of the average, the everydayness of the they, but in the form of transpersonal meaning. Meaning is not exhausted by Dasein. Rather, there is impersonal meaning, which of course is only experienceable for an existing subject, for example, mathematical meaning. There is objective meaning in the sense of significance a spirit. Against Heidegger, Cassira upholds the universal idealistic meaning of religion and the idealistic meaning of history. In this meaning, Cassira finds liberation and deliverance from the anxiety which is the signature, the basic state of mind of finite Dasein. This is life in the ideal, liberation from the ontological confinement and dullness of Dasein. World history, he says, in no way means to enter into the objectivity of an impersonal they. 
It is in Hegel's sense the abode of the idea. Not only Dasein, but meaning. The idea is primordially historical. Infinite time is not inauthentic. Heidegger wrongly supposes that the only alternative to the finite time of human life is objective physical time that Aristotle and Newton described. There's another alternative, the time of humanitas, humanity as a whole. For Heidegger, as an individualist, history is only the totality of religious individual destinies, each of which is irrationally thrown, dispersed into itself. By contrast, Kant himself proposed an alternative, saying, in man, those natural capacities which are directed to the use of his reason are to be fully developed only in the race, not in the individual, unquote. So, the true subject of reason is not each man individually, but humanity as a whole. Here we take a stand, Kassira declares, on the same ground as Hegel against Kierkegaard. The idea of humanitas also allows us to accept eternal truth, accept eternal truths, whose contemplation is a refuge from the pain and anxiety involved in the life of Dasein. There's no individual immortality, except as we look at things, including ourselves, sub speciae aeternitatis, under the aspect of eternity. We should develop amor fati, a love of fate, a stoical acceptance of things that's been re recommended from antiquity down to Spinoza and Nietzsche. In this way, life itself is raised above the realm of care. Kassira's account of Hegel is often disputable. Sorry, Kassira's account of Heidegger is often disputable. It's not obvious that Heidegger disliked inauthenticity as much as Kassira supposes, or that Heidegger's philosophy allowed him no access to the transpersonal. Let me take one particular problem just to conclude. Heidegger notoriously said that before Newton's laws were discovered, they were not true. He adds that this doesn't entail that the, quote, the beings which they point out in a discovering way did not previously exist, but he insists that there are eternal truths will not be adequately proven until it is successfully demonstrated that Dasein has been and will be for all eternity. Unquote. This passage shows two things. First, Heidegger's denial of eternal truths does not depend on individual mortality. Augustine argued that individual mortality would rule out eternal truths, and so that we are immortal as individuals. But Heidegger doesn't make that connection. His problem with eternal truths is that to be true, they must be discovered, known, but if humans as a species are not eternal, then truths can't be known for eternity. That is, they can't be eternal truths, or truths at all if they're not discovered. Secondly, Heidegger's claim that Newton's laws weren't true before their discovery looks trivial when he adds that even before Newton, beings may have existed in the way he said. Truth for Heidegger doesn't mean what Kassira meant by it. It means disclosed or opened up. And then it seems to me it's simply obvious that Newton's laws were not true before he discovered them. It's also obvious that unless humanity exists eternally, there can't be eternal truths in Heidegger's sense. But it may be that Heidegger, Heidegger and he probably does hold, perhaps he holds, a doctrine that's less trivial, that Newton's view is only true for us post-Newtonian, but pre-Einsteinian humans. It wasn't true for the ancient Greeks, their view of the world was true for them. Our view and the Greek view are not such that one is true and the other false, they're just incommensurable. We're familiar with this idea from T.S. Kuhn, but Heidegger probably owes it to Oswald Spengler, whose bestseller, The Decline of the West, had many detractors but two distinguished admirers, Heidegger and Wittgenstein. Now, on either of these accounts, Heidegger believes that it's humans with their unique temporality who disclose and open up beings and thereby give rise to being uh, as a noun, uh, as an abstract noun with a capital B, give rise to being and make things into a world, into a significant whole. Kassira calls this idealism. 
But he quite likely misunderstood Heidegger's terminology. Someone at the Davos debate complained that Heidegger and Kassira used different vocabularies, which are hard to translate into each other. So, the two disputants at Davos, the champion of life or Dasein, and the Hegelian champion of spirit, found it as hard to understand each other as we find it to understand either of them. <laughs>